This wonderful specialization of bees was tested in an experiment done in California. In this experiment, three containers of sugar water were placed in three different locations. Shortly afterwards, forager bees discovered these sources. The forager bees that came to the first container were marked with a dot. Those who came to the second container were marked with a line. And those who came to the third container were marked with a plus sign. Minutes later, bees in the hive were observed carefully watching these forager bees. Scientists also marked with a dot those bees watching forager bees marked with a dot and likewise they marked other bees with the same signs as those of the forager bees they were watching. Some minutes later, bees marked with a dot arrived at the first container, bees marked with a line arrived at the second container, and those marked with a plus sign came to the third container. So it was proved that the bees in the hive found their direction according to information related by the forager bees. All these facts should be carefully considered. Where did the bees get their amazing organization? How can a small insect that does not have the faculty of thought or intellect act as a forager? How can it think to search out sources of nutrients and inform its nestmates of them? Even if it thought about it, how could it develop a dance technique to inform the others where the source was located and the distance to it? How can bees in the hive understand the meaning of the complicated movements and vibrations of the messenger bees? Darwin's theory of evolution, which claims that life on Earth came about by chance, has no answer to these questions. Each of these special qualities of bees shows that their creator gave them to them. Allah created them and inspired them to do their work. This fact is in the Quran. Your Lord inspired the bees. Make hives in the mountains and in the trees and in what they build. Then eat of all the fruits and walk in the ways of your Lord submissively. There comes forth from within it a beverage of many colors in which there is a healing for men. Most surely there is a sign in this for people who reflect. There is a remarkable kind of butterfly that lives in southern Canada. The famous monarch butterfly. Every monarch, like every other butterfly, comes into the world after having gone through a perfectly designed series of changes. First, the mother butterfly deposits her eggs on a leaf.
The larvae that hatch feed for a time on the leaves before becoming caterpillars. Later, they make a nest called a cocoon for themselves. The cocoon of a monarch butterfly is a wonder of design. It is attached to a branch of a tree with a very slender but strong thread. The caterpillar develops in this cocoon and gradually emerges as a wonderful new creature, a butterfly. At first its wings are flat and lifeless. But they expand as blood is pumped into them and the monarch is ready to fly. There is a very interesting piece of behavior that distinguishes monarchs from other species of butterfly. In the course of a year, four different generations of monarchs are produced. The first three generations have an average lifespan of about five to six weeks. But the fourth generation is very different. This generation will survive until it has completed an eight-month migration. The migration begins from various monarch centers in southern Canada and moves further south. One group goes to California, and another group even further south to Mexico. It is interesting that all the monarchs meet each other on the way, as if they had received a command from one single center and continue together on the migration. The beginning of the monarch's migration has also been planned from one single center. They do not start out on their journey on just any day, but on that one day in the autumn, the autumnal equinox, when day and night are the same duration. After flying for two months, they reach the hot forests of the south. Millions of monarchs cover the trees like a tissue, and for four months, from December to March, they stay there eating nothing. They survive on fat stored in their bodies and only drinking water. The blossoming of the flowers in the spring is very important for the monarchs. After waiting for four months, they feast on nectar. Now they have stored the energy they will need to return to Northern America. At the end of March, before beginning their journey, they mate. On that day, the spring equinox, when day and night are of equal duration, the colony begins its flight north. At the end of their journey, they reach Canada and die shortly afterwards. But before they die, they give birth to the first generation of the year, which will survive for about one and a half months. Later, the second and third generations are succeeded by the fourth, which will once again begin the migration. This generation will again live six months longer than the others, and thus the chain continues. This amazing migration brings many questions to mind. How is it that each fourth generation is born so as to live six months longer than the others? How does this long-lived generation always coincide with the winter months? How do the butterflies always begin their migration on that day when night and day are of equal length? And how are they able to make that delicate calculation? How does the new generation of monarchs that has never before gone on a migration